In the last section of this video series, what we looked through were the teachings of Bill Johnson himself and checked whether or not they lined up with scripture. On this segment, what we want to show you is the effect that his teachings have had on a number of people and maybe, if you're honest, maybe they've had an effect on you. And what we want to do is examine it and prove without a doubt that this isn't Beth Ol, a house of God, but this is Beth Hell. From someone who is still here at Bethel, I can attest to the fact that they are preaching a false gospel. In a vision, Jesus picks me up and he says, please forgive me. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. We make a mistake in thinking he is in control of everything. Our authority, our will, has an effect on what happens around us. Ye is big G, and you are little G. You're little G, God. Thank you for joining us on the second segment of our series, Examining the Teachings of Bethel. With me today is Good Fight Ministries' own president and founder and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing? I'm very blessed, brother. Well, praise the Lord. I, I'm excited because on the last episode, what we went through were the teachings of Bill Johnson specifically. And one of the things that we determined, one, is that it was very unbiblical. The things that he was teaching were just not found in Scripture. They were foreign to it. And what we wanted to do was not only examine what Bill Johnson teaches, but also what some of the followers of Bill Johnson, what some of the family members of Bill Johnson mm -hmm. happened to teach. And the first person that we want to look, like, look at is somebody who's one with him. Yeah, that's right. Benny Johnson. That is Bill Johnson's wife, and she's considered a te teacher or pastor at Bethel, and she's taught a lot of very interesting things to the mm -hmm. congregation. And so what we want to do is examine exactly what she teaches in light of Scripture. And one of the first things we want to look at is a clip where she talks about a young Bethel student talking with angels. She had an experience with an angel before she came to the school. She woke up one morning, and the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to go to Mariah Chapel and say, wakey, wakey. <laughs> How many of you have heard this story? Oh, cool, not very many. Awesome. <laughs> Such a fun story. And she argued with God, and she didn't win. So she went to the chapel. How many of you have been to Mariah Chapel in Wales? Anyway, she, she gets up and she goes to Mariah Chapel and she stands in front of the chapel and she goes, wakey, wakey. And the Lord whispers to her and says, how, is that how bad you want it? So she stood there and I mean, it's right there on the busy street and she said, of course, there were all kinds of people there that day. And she yelled, wakey, wakey, and walked, turned around and walked away. And when she turned around and walked away, she felt the earth shake under her feet. And uh, she turned around and saw this huge angel. She is a seer. She can see into the spirit realm. And she said, um, why are you here? And the angel said, I'm the angel of a 1904 revival. And she said, well, are you the angel that's bringing the next one? And he goes, no, I'm not the one, because the next one is going to bring many, 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 many more souls into the kingdom. It's very interesting to hear that clip and to hear her, I can't get around it. It sounds like she's talking about a student of hers commanding mm -hmm. angels, or not necessarily commanding angels, or we can actually examine that a little bit, but just calling upon angels. And this seems like it may be a common thread with Bethel for a number of years. Yeah, this is incredibly serious stuff because the Lord warns us not to seek the spiritual realm, to seek Him. Uh, the Bible says very clearly 
in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. Uh, to the line of the testimony, it says, if somebody does not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. And that's the commentary or the comment on the verse before that, where it says, you ought to, are, you know, not to seek the dead, you're supposed to seek the living God. Why don't you seek your God? Uh, why do you seek the dead among the living, you know? So we're not supposed to seek the dead, we're not supposed to speak, seek uh, through necromancy, uh, people that have died, which we're going to be examining in this episode. And we're still, and we're not supposed to seek out angels. There's no command anywhere in the scripture where it says to call on angels. In fact, there's a song, a Bethel song, which is calling all angels, and they sing it, calling the angels. And it's like, you know, do you have a walk with God? Do you know God? And do you realize there's more power in God? And that's why he says we ought to seek him and not the dead, for instance. We're not to seek the dead, we're not to seek out angels, because in, in chapter 8, verse 19 and 20 of Isaiah, he specifically states that you should be seeking him, because he's the one true God. We should be relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Why are you seeking out angels? And this is very, very concerning, or disconcerting, I should say, because we're talking about seeking spirits. The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 1 that God makes his angels ministering spirits. But there are fallen angels, and angels don't follow our calls or our commands and when we beckon them. If, and if there's a spirit responding to you, and you're not seeking God, and you're saying, wakey, wakey, uh, that's going to be a spirit from another realm. Uh, the demonic realm, I would say. So it's interesting because, by the way, Benny Johnson, the wife of uh, Bill Johnson there, her name wasn't Benny. She changed her name to Benny because of her affection for Benny Hinn and wanting to emulate his ministry. And Benny Hinn is very much into seeking power from people that have died, you know, uh, these kinds of experiential, uh, uh, this experiential form of Christianity, which is not real Christianity. So it's important that we understand this. Uh, in fact, she goes on and she talks about uh, this woman going to a shop and she's going to do shopping and then she decides to, you know, check out and cry out, wakey, wakey to, you know, an angel and this big giant angel gets up from the sleep. And he's been sleeping for, since 1904, you know, for 100 plus years or so, and which is ridiculous. He's like asleep in the pavement. And he comes out and she says he's like the Hulk because she could just see his feet, he's so big. And this is all just ridiculous. When angels appear before humans in the scripture, they appear very human, not as giant hulks where you just see their feet. And it all has the, well, the, well think about how it started. She thinks it's God speaking to her to go cry out, wakey, wakey. So I believe that was either, she either made this up and she, she's lying or she has a lying spirit deceiving her into thinking that this is all from God. So you have songs, their worship, and we're talking about Bethel's worship. That's a very yeah. unscriptural song. Their, their worship music is very popular. And then you have this wakey-wakey experience, and, and the angel tells her, this angel says, you know, because you know, like, why have you been asleep all this time? Because nobody prayed for revival. That's a lie. Uh, how many believers, I think most genuine believers, pray for revival all the time, pray for people to come to Christ, pray that uh, there would be revival and more people would come to Christ. So uh, it's a lying spirit when it says she's the first one that prayed for revival. It, we know it's a lie in its face. And do these people lack just total discernment? So, and we, you know, the wakey-wakey thing is biblically it's wacky-wacky. It's not in the Bible. You don't find it from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. It's nowhere in Scripture, and it's heartbreaking because this, is, this gets really serious because the Bible says last days, many or some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctors of demons. And when you start entertaining angels by way of seeking them out and seeking to get power from them, uh, you're basically opening yourself up to demonic forces. It's nowhere, the Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's our mediator. We're not supposed to be seeking angels. We're supposed to be seeking the Father through the Son. Yeah, and it's really interesting because this has become quite controversial, but something I think probably the most controversial subject that a lot of you know, discernment ministries got involved in exposing was their grave soaking episode. And Ooh, the fact one. is, is that they've come out and, and Bill Johnson had to do his PR move and said, hey, really, we had nothing to do with any of this grave soaking that was going on. You had Benny Johnson, as you can see through our through our images, Benny Johnson, his wife, laying on the graves of those of C.S. Lewis yeah. and of Charles Finney. So it's undeniable. We have the evidence that and it's even worse. It's, do, it's, it's yeah, it's more undeniable. Not only because she posted it, yeah. but the fact that the affirmation of members of Bethel oh, writing of on of Instagram. Supernatural and 
Oh yeah, right? and and think about this. You have all these people talking about how encouraged they are. Give me some of that on her images on her Instagram page, and yet there's no rebuke there. Oh yeah, we don't accept this. Then we have video of Bethel students going yep. and doing this very act at Smith at, at Smith Wigglesworth's grave and. We look at these things and you say, what is going on there? What kind of shepherding is going on that anyone would be led to believe that you should be going to graves and sucking some sort of anointing from them? And and I got to ask you, where is that biblically? Well, it's interesting because when you go to the scripture, and I want to just go to the scripture itself uh, because I referenced it earlier, but in Isaiah chapter 8, it's just quite clear. it says in verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord have given me, talks about you know his children, and then uh, how there'll be a witness, which I alluded to in the last show, which is kind of interesting. But he says something quite interesting. He says uh, uh, in verse 19, and, they say, and when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists, okay, who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living so we're not supposed to consult the dead. And then in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn, they have no light. And it's interesting, I think deep down they know it's wicked or they know it's wrong. They at least aren't trying to defend it. Bill Johnson is saying, oh yeah, my wife's been doing a bunch of grave sucking and a bunch of uh, other, our students have, uh, when he's been interviewed about it, he kind of like tries to kind of tiptoe around it a bit. Why? If you believe it's from God and you believe it's defensible and so forth, why don't you be quite honest and blunt? This is what we do. But his wife has done it. It's partner in ministry. Uh, people at the school, as you've said, it, has, it was never like radically denounced. So what you're having is they're seeking, and please understand, uh, we hope our brothers and sisters understand, we're talking about going to graveyards and seeking spiritual power from those who are dead. And their bo- it's just their bodies that are there. And this is a practice that's been going on for some time. In fact, she's named herself, as I mentioned, uh, after uh, Benny Hinn. She changed her name to Benny. Well, let's listen to what Benny Hinn says. He goes to Amy Simple McPherson's grave, okay? He goes to this woman's grave and he says, I felt terrific, this terrific anointing when I was there. I actually, I, I hear this, I trembled and I visited Amy's tomb and I was shaking all over. God's power came all over me. I believe the anointing has lingered over Amy's body. You know, I know this to be shocking, is gonna be shocking to you. Then he goes on to talk about how he goes, you, you, you're going to feel like this anointed Amy's tomb. It's incredible. And Catherine, Catherine, Catherine Coleman, he said, it's amazing. I've heard people healed when they visited the tomb. Uh, they were totally healed by God's power. You say, uh, it's a crazy thing. He says, brother, huh, there are things we'll never understand. And, uh, and you're hearing, are you hearing me? So what they're trying to do is encourage the people to go to graveyards of people that they admire that supposedly had anointed the past and pick up their vibrations, pick up their powers, pick up supernatural power from the dead. And this is more occult orientated, orientated because uh, it's, it's, it's occult orientated because in the occult you have the practice of necromancy where you seek power from those who have died. Uh, where they'll, I mean, they'll commit all kinds of acts with the dead, uh, but if they could just be, have a dead bone maybe, they'll, they'll have intrinsic spiritual power. And guess what? I don't doubt at times they get power because demons will use a stump if they get someone to bow down to a stump, a rock that somebody prays. These are all idols. So this is idolatry. This is a form of, of ancient idolatry is praying to ancestors, going to ancestors, graves for power. And this is the occult moving into the church again. Very, very serious. Numbers chapter 19, 16 says, and whoever touches one that is slain, with a sword in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. I mean, that's just blatant scripture. You go and you touch a grave and, you know, these guys are doing it for power. You would be considered unclean in God's sight, you know, yet they're glorifying it. Leviticus 19.31 says, Do not turn to mediums or necromancers, those who contact the dead. Do not seek them out, and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, that I love that passage because he says, When thou art come to the land which the Lord thy God has given thee, talk about the promised land, thou shalt not learn to practice the abomination of those nations. He gives this long list of wizards and witchcrafts and media, you know, those who read omens and so forth. And he mentions necromancers again. So uh, we have, you know, Bill and, and Jenny Johnson specifically, or I'm sorry, Benny, John, uh, Benny Johnson, named after Benny Inn, 
uh, seeking, like Benny had did, power from the dead and leading many of their students in that same lie. And again, if you really are experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, like they're claiming to experience, why would you need that? You know what? I don't need that. I, I trust in the Lord. I see the Holy Spirit, Lord God, working in my life. I'm not lusting. Or, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit would give you such power that he over, he'd overflow you in such a way that you went thirst. Yet guess what? It shows you that they're not experiencing the joy and the fullness of the Spirit because they're seeking power the in mediums. another way, which shows you that deep down they know they're missing something. And what we're really missing at this point is if you're not seeking the right Jesus, and you're seeking signs and wonders and miracles, and that's what your whole focus is, then you're missing Jesus because the Bible says, as Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after miracles. So we don't seek miracles, we seek Jesus. And the Bible says signs will follow those who believe. Not, you know, uh, believers will follow the signs. So when we follow Jesus, we trust him. Then we allow him and his sovereignty to do whatever miracles he wants to do as we seek him and we glorify him. But if you're seeking the miracle, you're getting the cart before the horse and you're missing Jesus. And it's like going to his banqueting table and being all excited about what's on the table rather than the person that's at the table, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're caught up in his love and the wonder of his will and the being just thankful and amazed that he would save us, us wretches who are doomed without him, if we get excited about that and excited about seeing people that are lost saved and excited about the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes the Jew first and also the Greek. You know, remember last episode, you know, he was talking about Mr. Johnson, Bill Johnson, about how you got to do miracles. No, the Bible says the power of the, God, that the, power of the gospel is salvation of the Jew first and also the Greek. The gospel itself is the power of God. So uh, it's really heartbreaking that they're seeking angels, calling angels, because there's a dissatisfaction with Jesus and the Holy Spirit in their lives, or they're seeking dead people in their bones to get power, because there's, a, there's an emptiness when you don't follow Jesus the way we're called to. When you truly follow him, You'll have the fruit of the Spirit, the love, peace, and joy, and you'll have the power that He deems fit for your specific ministry as to whatever He's called you to. He's in charge of that. We just do His will. Yeah, amen. And, you know, it's really sad. If there was ever a, a time where we can very easily see it in an example is that they are trading broken cisterns. I mean, you're talking about dead yeah. bodies. Yeah. For street, you know, you traded the, the, the living water, right? Yeah. We, the living water that would flow inside Jeremiah of us. Jeremiah chapter 2. Amen. And we would trade that for And another comment cisterns. before we move on. Benny Hinn says of Catherine Coleman, and she was a healer like Amy Simple McPherson. Uh, he, he saw her. You know, she appeared to him. Dead person. I heard Catherine's voice and suddenly there was, a, it was crystal clear. And she, with her beautiful smile, she said, ask. We're asking for you to ask. We're praying with you to we're praying with you to ask. And the vision disappeared. And suddenly I said, Lord, and I asked. And a week later, the anointing hit my life. The anointing hit you as a result of Catherine Coleman? What about a relationship with Jesus and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit? So when you start as you're seeking angels, you're seeking dead people, uh, there's red flags because that's it's totally unscriptural, but it also shows you there's something really wrong, wacky wacky with your theology. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. And one of the things that I mean, when you come from that and then move down the train here a little bit, and then we go into Jen Johnson, who is the co-founder of Bethel Music with yeah. her husband, Brian, and Jen Johnson talking about the Holy Spirit, because that's what we're talking about. What is this spirit behind all this? Is it the Holy Spirit that we see or in Scripture? Yep. Or is there something else? And she actually has told us exactly what she sees the Holy Spirit as. And the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. Wow. And he's blue. Unplanned, perfect. And he's funny. And he's sneaky. And he's courageous and he's everywhere. And he's wonderful. That's who he is to me. And he's funny. He's sneaky. He's silly. He's wonderful. And I view him like the genie from Aladdin. I don't know where in my life that just kind of like came up. Maybe when I was like 10. I don't know. But 
Yeah, it's really interesting when you hear that, when you hear over and over again the same thing, because a lot of times, in all honesty, looking through and listening to all the teachings of Bethel, one of the things I've noticed over and over again is that they typically will make excuses when there's something that they taught that was just so outlandish. And when it comes to this, over and over again, the genie from Aladdin equating God himself, the Holy Spirit, the genie from Aladdin, what do you think about that biblically? Wow, you know, uh, we've looked at calling angels, we've looked at, you know, seeking the dead and their power, and now we're calling the, you know, the Holy Spirit comparing to a genie. Genies come from the word jinn, and jinn were these spirits, often hostile, demonic type entities, right, in Islam, you know, and the genies were, uh, what blows me away about this when I hear her talk, I'm like, if you've experienced, when we've experienced the Lord God in our lives. And there's times we really experience, you know, uh, deeper revelations of the Lord than others. And when he reveals himself to you and through the reading of scripture, through prayer and so forth. And the deeper your encounter, the more reverent you are, the more in awe of him. Like when Isaiah, you know, uh, was at a pivotal time in his life and he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he sees the holy seraphim with with wings you know, over their faces and two flying and two over their, their feet and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, he's just transfixed, blown away and he's not like, oh, you're so silly, God. Oh, you're, you're funny and- You're no, sneaky. You're <laughs> sneaky. You know, he's like, woe is me, I am undone. You know, I'm mad of unclean lips from people to unclean lips, woe is me. And uh, you see throughout scripture when there's encounters with God, from Genesis to Revelation, they're falling on their face there's a fear and a trembling. There's a wow, it's an amazing experience, you know. So I hear that, I, I'm sorry. It's a, it, it shows me that she's not encountering the God of the Bible because it's not a trivial, cavalier, casual uh, kind of thing. It's, 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 it's not something where you compare him to a demon, a genie, you know. And by the way, genies, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that kind of just coalesce with the whole New Age movement here and the whole idea about, I mean, The Secret, which was very, very popular, millions sold uh, the videos and so forth, in the occult where they think that they're little gods and, and, that, and they have a genie come out of a bottle or in the very beginning of the video and they compare it to commanding the power of the universe, God, into doing your own will and that's the secret is you can command the power of the universe, God, in their many of them say, and then you can get them to do your will. And I, and I watched that. I'm like, yeah, man, you know, I almost did a video, an expose on it, and I am not, getting, not doing it. Uh, I did some of it, but it just became a little bit passe. And I thought, wow, it's so similar to the word faith movement, the prosperity movement, what's going on right now in Bethel, is they're commanding God. They're treating him like a genie, as someone that is at their beck and call, like he's a divine bellhop and they just need to use the right words and the right formula and the power of the words make him have to work. Because we talked about the lack of understanding of God's sovereignty in the first episode. Well, when you start to see how it works and where you bait, God can't really do anything because he's handcuffed, he's bound without us. But then you, God is basically bound to do what you will him to do if you use the right words. And it's interesting because listen to hear what Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, these are that the, the Bethel teachers are, have been in awe of these prosperity teachers. And when you, when you go to their links page, at least in the past, I haven't been to the links page in a while, but it's like a who's who in heretics. And, oh, yeah. and a lot of these guys are on there. So it's interesting that these guys themselves, like she's compared, Jenny uh, Johnson has compared the, you know, you know, the Holy Spirit to a genie and, and so forth. They've compared the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God to witchcraft and I'm talking about Copeland and, and Benny Hinn, the biggest word faith prosperity teachers that have been around for years. Copeland, uh, or Kenneth Copeland says, as a believer, you have the right to make commands. He says, each time you stand on the word, you are commanding God to a certain extent because it's in his word, he is bound by it. Now that's what they teach in witchcraft. I came out of the occult and I've studied the occult and witchcraft and in the occult, demons are bound by certain things you say. They, you know, certain circles you, you, you for protection, uh, certain curses, certain things that, because there's these spiritual laws. And what's really interesting, he's saying, and you never see in scripture, you know, people saying, God, you have to do this, I command you, and, you know. But here, this is more like witchcraft. That's Kenneth Copeland. Copeland says, all right, reach out there like it's a big lever sticking up like a, a slot machine and, and get a hold of it, you know? I mean, you get it in your hand and, and you got your teeth gritted and you, you got a good grip on it and rip it down some more and say, money, come out to me now. 
So you're commanding money to come out to you. And basically, you're commanding God to deliver the money. Money, come out to me now. He says again a third time. Money, come out to me now. Now, now he says, you shout about it. You need, and, he, and it's just crazy because you're seeing him. He's, it's, you know, it's a slot machine. Gospel is what it is. Benny Hinn says, uh, if witches, and by the way, you know, I've got a quote, quotes here from uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland where he says, Words create pictures, and pictures, he compares it to the New Age movement. And, and pictures in your mind create words. He's talking about using visualization, guided imagery. And then the, word, the words come back out of your mouth. And, and that's a spiritual force that's come out. It's going to give substance to the image that's on the inside of you. Ah, and keep in mind, they teach that we're gods, you know. Ah, that's the visualization stuff, he says. Ah, that's that New Age. No, New Age is trying to do this. And they get somewhat, they get somewhat results out of it because this is a spiritual law, brother. So he's saying, wait, that sounds like the New Age. It sounds like you're moving away from the scripture. Nah. And then he goes, yeah, actually it is. And they're actually getting results of it. And Benny Hinn says this, if witches and occultists can speak death by the supernatural power of words, then Christians can speak life and prosperity by the same power. Now catch that. That's key. He says, by the same power. So these see, guys see themselves as using the same techniques and relying on the same power that the Satanists are relying on. No, we're not. We're not. It's not like a yin and yang thing or some cosmic force that we're manipulating. The one true God created Lucifer. He fell. He became the diabolos, the, the adversary, the satanas, the opposer of God. And he has a realm of fallen angels that are at work with him, who are opposed to God, but God could stomp them out any time. He just allows them to exist because we're all being tested. Who are we going to follow? And what happens here is they're aligning with these spiritual demonic forces. And the reason they can talk like this is because their experiences are more along the lines of the occult than they are scripture. And when you see, you know, Benny Hinn talking about witchcraft, it's pretty much the same, the same power. And you see Bill Johnson's wife, Damon, her, renaming herself Benny after Benny Hinn. You see her and Jenny and Others talk the same way about, you know, it's like, it's like a genie that you're manipulating. What are we seeing here? We're seeing that they're aligning with very dark, diabolical forces. This is not the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the counterfeit spirit. Paul warned in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I fear for you because he says, I want to present you to the Lord as a pure virgin, that you, your minds might be deceived from your simple devotion to Christ, to Christ and you might believe in a different gospel and, he, you know, and a different Jesus. And he says, and that you might receive a different spirit. So he's concerned that true Christians that are betrothed to Christ can be deceived into receiving a different spirit. And then a few verses later, that's when he says, for Satan himself transforms himself into angel of light. It's no marvel that Satan transforms himself into angel of light and that his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to the works. So we're supposed to test this stuff, but there's no discernment. They talk about a lot of different gifts and they talk about a lot of things that aren't in the gifts whole other categories that they've made up. But one thing they don't talk about, and the Bible does talk about in 1 Corinthians 14 regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it talks about discernment of spirits. You never hear them talk about discernment of spirits, hardly, because if they had discernment of spirits, they would, as Walter Martin, Dr. Walter Martin used to say, run, do not walk to the nearest exit. They would flee these things and resist the devil. And so it's absolutely heartbreaking. In fact, uh, it's so heartbreaking that I hope if you're listening right now, that you, you, you at least take pause if you're involved in this movement in any way. And you might say, wait a minute, am I, why, why am I entertaining or drawn to a group that's seeking dead people for power, that's calling angels and, and, and referring to the Holy Spirit as like a genie? You might take pause, and I hope you do before God, before it's too late. You fall before, your, on God, before God in your face say, God have mercy on me. Thank you for using this program to rescue me from this darkness. May I seek you and your word and your word and you only. Yeah, and it's really interesting because one of the reasons that we've spent a little time here, uh, a lot of time, specifically talking about Jen Johnson and this viewpoint of the Holy Spirit is the fact that Bethel Music Group is one of the biggest things out there. Yeah. And they have more an effect. And a lot of the reason that people are being drawn to teachers at Bethel are because of the music. You see it, you see the logo, you see the music, you hear this song, and next thing you know, you're listening to Bill Johnson and the, yeah. all these maxim and you're getting fooled by it. So we wanna make sure you guys have a good understanding of where they are coming from. And one of the interesting things, as we continue, you guys have heard some of the connections already. His wife, right? And you see his family. And then you also hear he's got this connection somewhat to Benny Hinn as well. 
And then we look and we see, wait a second, but where did Bill Johnson come from? What kind of mantles is he yeah. trying to get? Mm -hmm. And what is he handing out to other people? And in fact, we have a clip right now that talks about this mantle that he wants to not only have imparted to himself, but to his congregation. But what I'm believing for is a generation. A generation will rise up with a corporate faith, a corporate anointing to press into realms because it's my conviction that as much as God put on a William Branham or a Catherine Kuhlman or a Wigglesworth, he'll put far greater anointing on a company of people than he ever would on an individual. Now just put your hand on your head. Say, please renew it. <laughs> please renew this mind. Lord, we, we are so hungry for you to continue to change how we think. And it's really interesting because there's this impartation. You might have heard the name, and if you haven't heard it yet, what I want you to notice is that Bill Johnson in this next clip is going to be handing this mantle over to someone else, someone very, very important to Bethel and very, very important to this movement. And listen to the person, because we're going to examine his teachings after this, but listen to the person whose mantle is being handed from Bill Johnson, from according to his congregation as well, but then also to another person. And who is this mantle? Who is this person, this impartation that's taking place? We want to pray for folks and go after those things that have been called impossible. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I was remembering um, several years ago, I was laying on the floor. Um, I think it may have been in a prayer chapel, but and it's asking God if I could have the... Uh, mantle of William Branham. I just got done. In fact, Bill has a, a series of uh, uh, video, old videos of William Branham, and I just watched one of them where he called out about 40 people in a row, and he said, your, your name is like John, and your doctor's name is Dr. You know, Henry, and you got uh, cancer of whatever, and, and uh, your sister Mary told you to come here, and did that to, with about 30 or 40 people on this video. So I got done watching that video. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't even have a prophetic gift. And so I was in the prayer chapel. I'm laying on the floor and I said, God, would you give me the mantle of William Branham? And he said, well, how could I do that? If I did that, it would, it would destroy you. So, and I was laying there. It was like the Lord asked, how could I do that? I, so then I said, I waited about a few minutes and I was thinking about it. I said, well, you could put the same mantle on a whole generation. Then we wouldn't stand out from one another. He said, all right, I'll do that. Not awesome. That's what the Lord wants to do. Interesting, this William Branham, this mantle, this powerful mantle from William Branham. They want to put on this teaching, this imparting of the spirit that was behind William Branham. So what does William Branham teach? Let's play a clip. Now, my precious brother, I know this is a tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. Too close yeah, to the coming, man. See? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus saith the Lord. Amen. I don't know if you guys heard that properly, but he just said Trinitarianism, the doctrine of the triune Godhead, is from the devil. And this is the mantle that they want? Who on earth, Joe, is William Branham? Well, he just denied the Trinity, denies the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, William Branham was a Baptist preacher for some time, uh, 40s, 50s, and uh, not long after that, he uh, got influenced by the United Pentecostal cult. And the United Pentecostals were uh, considered heretics. That's a long story, but uh, by the other charismatic or other Pentecostal churches because they denied the Trinity. Uh, they taught you must speak in tongues to be saved. They taught a lot of strange teachings. They're still around to this day. And he was heavily influenced by them. And he denied the triune God. Denied Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Denies uh, the Father and the Son. First John chapter 2, Chad, you know. First John chapter 2 says if you deny the Father and Son, you are what? Antichrist. Antichrist. He denies yeah. that there's actually a Father and Son and Holy Spirit, three persons. He just believes there's just one person. 
and modalism. That's an ancient heresy. It goes back into the, it was refuted by the early church fathers long ago. So he is a, uh, William Branham was an arch heretic. People knew that he was a heretic. In fact, he made false prophecies revealing that he wasn't a true prophet of God. He believed he was the seventh angel. He believed he was the angel to the church of Laodicea. Uh, he believed he had a special call as an angel to the church of Laodicea. There are people that follow him to this day that believe he's Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, he believed in the serpent seed doctrine. It's really strange things he, that, that Satan had sex with Eve and birthed Cain. So he had all these really wild, uh, wild teachings. He believed he was Elijah, the prophet. Uh, there's a lot of strange things regarding uh, William Branham. But uh, he made a lot of false prophecies. And you're talking about a guy who believes that Satan had sex with Eve, believes he's Elijah, denies the Father God and the Holy Spirit, which is blasphemy, right? Says that, you know, there's no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just Jesus, and there's no Trinity. And he says the Trinity is of the devil. So he's calling the, the, the Scripture, which tells us to baptize the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which he says is wrong, contradicts that Scripture. You can only baptize the name of Jesus. Uh, so he contradicts Scripture. He calls the doctrine. The Scriptures really teach very clearly that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as the beginning with God, and He made all things, right? And through Christ, all things were made, and the Father made everything through Jesus, and He sent forth His Spirit, and things were, everything was created, and Christ became f flesh. Jesus prays to the Father in heaven, who sends the Holy Spirit upon Him, three persons. Even in the book of Revelation, you see the Father, you see Jesus at His right hand, the scroll, no one can open the scroll, but the Son takes the scroll from the Father, showing there's the Father and the Son, and then you see the the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Revelation as well. The Spirit and the Bride say, come, let whoever so will. On and on, we can go on and on with that. But that's one of the clearest teachings of Scripture. And that was so supported by the Lord Church Fathers, the, the, the triune teaching of God. So he is a heretic. The reason that Jehovah Witnesses, the reason the Mormons are considered cults along with the United Pentecostal Church is because they deny the Trinity. They deny the, the, the deity of Christ in the, in, in the biblical teaching of the Trinity. So I think it's very, very important that we understand that we're talking about Bethel, and they're talking about wanting the mantle of a heretic. Now again, why do you need to go to someone besides Jesus? Why do you need to go to someone beyond Father, Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit? Again, because they're lacking power of God ultimately. They're trying to concoct, putting gold dust in their church. where people, Oh, look, oh, it's a miracle. They're doing a lot of strange things, so people think that they're uh, being anointed by God, but they're seeking power in all these weird places we've been discovering in this episode, which to me is a blatant admission that they lack power. You so I don't wake up in the morning saying, I got a grave suck, I gotta go soak a grave, I've gotta go call an angel, I've gotta get a mantle from somebody else. I go, Lord God, may you be glorified in my life and may you use me to your glory so I can give you more glory and empower me. So it's really, really, really heartbreaking when you think about it. But let me show you a false prophecy. This was one that he gave to his son that his son testifies about. His son's a very, very old man. He's 85 years old, not much time left. Uh, and this is in the book called Acts of the Prophet, okay? Page 119, and it's about William Branham, and it's not done, it's not a neg negative book on him, and it's a prophecy he wrote to his, he gave to his son, his, and his son was in Los Angeles, and he's in front of, you know, May Company, and he, William Branham, he writes, turned to his son and said, Billy, where are you standing? And Billy says, downtown Los Angeles, Billy replied. Where are you standing? Queried the prophet. In front of May Company, downtown Los Angeles, replied, replied Billy. And at this, Brother Branham made a prophetic statement. Billy, he said, I may not be here, but you won't be, but you won't be an old man until sharks swim right where you are standing. Catch what he said. This is prophecy. Billy, he said, I may not be here, but you won't be an old man until sharks will swim right where you are standing because he prophesied, because he got a prediction from certain scientists who were off and Edgar Cayce, the psychic, yeah. had been saying years before that, that Los Angeles and California would sink into the sea. Before he was saying that, then he started saying that, but it was from God, the Holy Spirit showed him. He said, son, you're not gonna grow into old man. You're gonna be a young man still when sharks are swimming over where you're at now in LA. Did that happen? We, we're like just outside of LA. We're just 10 minutes from LA County right here. And by the way, uh, Billy Paul, his son, was born September 13th, 1935, he says, which uh, his marriage certificate says September 13th, 1934, of his, before his first divorce. So he's either 30, 85 right now, or in September he's going to turn 85. Is he an old man? The prophecy was that he would not become an old man. Now this is important because guess what? I've 
got testimony from William Branham when he's in his 40s talking about how he's an old man already. Well, if Branham considered himself an old man in his 40s, what is his son now at the age of 84, 85? In fact, let's go to the scripture, Psalm 90, verse 10. 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80, but even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. So, uh, soon they disappear and we fly away. So the Bible says you can live to 70, that's pretty old. Some get to even 80. Of course, there's even exceptions beyond that. He's 85. Biblically, he's an old man. Biblically, guess what? William Branham is a false prophet. But yeah. people love lies, and they, they put their faith in man more than God, but he is to be rejected. And this is the false prophet they want to get their mantle of power from, a one who is inspired by Satan, not the Holy Spirit, who actually refutes the, tries to refute the Trinity and call it the devil. Yeah, it's really interesting. Imagine if we had video of a teacher saying, I'm calling on the mantle of Charles Taze Russell and, and of Joseph Smith. We would say, that's Good a comparison. heretic. Yeah. What are you doing? And the fact is, is that if that's the spirit that you're getting from, and I'm not talking about the spirit of that heretic, but the spirit that was behind that heretic, because the fact is, is that spirit will lead you into falsehood because the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. And these teachings are so far away from truth. And when it comes to that handing off of the mic, which kind of seemed like a handing off of the mantle as he cried out for this mantle and it would be poured out onto everybody, right? This mantle of heresy. Chris Vallatin right there accepts that mantle, prays for that mantle, and then has his own false teachings, which we're going to play a clip here so you can hear out of his own mouth one of the word of faith heresies that is very, very common. He said, heal the sick. Well, only God can heal the sick. That's why he said, the imitators of God. Listen, I can't heal the sick. Only God can heal the sick. That's right. You are sons of God. In fact, Jesus quoted the psalmist when he said, you are gods, and the word is, gods is little g. Ye is big g, and you are little g. You're little g, God. I understand we're not Mormons. Don't take this too far. I'm saying that before you were born again, you were created a little lower than the angels. But when you got born again, the angels serve you. Now you became heirs of salvation in which the angels serve. Interestingly enough, the once again, very common in the Word of Faith movement specifically, in the prosperity gospel specifically, the very common doctrine of the little gods doctrine. So, Joe, is this true? Are we just little gods? Well, it's interesting. He said, well, let's not take this too far because we're not Mormons. Uh, he misquoted Jesus. He didn't give the context there. And he took it further than the Mormons because the Mormons don't say that they're gods right now. They're gods in embryo. They're trying to become gods. He's telling them that they are gods right now. So it's actually going further than the Mormons when you think about it. But it's interesting because uh, when Jesus says this, he doesn't tell the Pharisees, the people that are trying to kill him, who he says, you're your father, the devil. He's not saying you are gods. He's quoting from Psalm 82 of the judges who were given, an, who were given positions to uh, delegated authority by God uh, to act and had misused their power. Some believe they're speaking of human judges. Some believe it's speaking of angelic uh, powers. But it's interesting. Uh, we don't have time to get into that. But listen to what the text says in, in Psalm 82, verse 6 that Jesus quotes. I have said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. They're mere men, ultimately. They're going to die. They misuse their positions. God said to, for instance, uh, Moses, because no, Moses was very timid, I can't speak. The Lord says, I'll be with your mouth. And then he was still concerned, but he was going to send him. And he says, I'll make you like a god to Pharaoh. It didn't mean he was transformed into a supernatural being. There can only be one God, because there's only one uncreated creator of all things. So all bets are off. No one can become a God because there's only one true God. There's only one who possesses immortality, is, has immortality in of himself, is the creator of all things, all, all powerful and so forth. Uh, so it's interesting because Satan's first lie was, you shall be as gods, right? One of his first lies. Satan's lie, his self-deluding lie was, I will be like the most high God. The lie that the Antichrist will perpetuate is, he'll sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So these are lies that all fit together uh, for people that have itching ears, that want their ears tickled, that want to hear that they can be, have power, they can have supernatural power, they can become gods, they can command God, they can command angels, they can go get mantles from the dead. They, this is all ear-tickling stuff. 
And this is exactly what the Bible says in the last days. It says, men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own desires, they'll hope themselves many teachers will tickle the ears and tell them what they want to hear, and they'll be turned away from the truth and be turned to myths, mythology. This is a bunch of mythology, a bunch of scripture twisting that's going on. If you want to be a god in the end, listen to what happens to you in Jeremiah 10, 11. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth, that would be everybody but God, the one true God, will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. You're going to perish. Revelation 21.3 shows us what it's like in the eternal state. It doesn't say God's with a bunch of other gods. It says God himself will be with them and be their God. Okay? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Okay? We're still human beings created in God's image. So uh, these are all these New Age lies. We're seeing a bunch of New Age stuff that's being Christianized, baptized, paganism being baptized, and being given a, a Jesus name. And it's diluting the masses. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons they use that your little gods is because they take Proverbs 18.21 out of context where it's, there's life and death and the power of the tongue. Yeah, right. And so they say what you're doing as a little god is you have the power to create as well. Right. And so when you speak things, you can speak them in things into existence. And when we get into Sozo Prayer on the next segment, we're actually going to be talking about how this actually relates to that in terms of speaking negativity into your life yeah. and the wickedness. And you see how these doctrines go together and you see these favorite verses of the heretics and this is exactly what happens. And so we wanna be really careful about this and we wanna make sure that we answer these things biblically and make sure we understand when somebody is saying, oh, we're all just little gods. Do you want that fate? <laughs> Do you want the fate of Psalm 82? Because when Jesus was yeah. rebuking them with that, by the way, when Jesus was using they're that, their position, misusing their position, because they're, yeah. they're misusing their position. I know I don't want the fate of the men at Psalm 82. I want the fate of somebody who follows and loves on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Amen. one of the things we're, we're going to be looking at here is the fact that they are, they're not even strange bedfellows, they're just bedfellows with heretics. And that's exactly what's going on here. But one thing that you might find to be very interesting is that there are people that some may think are even orthodox that are involved with Bethel, especially through their music and yeah. how they sneak in. There's even people out in Texas, John Hagee has, he has a lot of problems with his doctrine, uh, but nonetheless, a lot of people didn't figure him fairly conservative and not in this yeah, cuckoo land. True. But you see his son taking over over there and you see their connection with Bethel and how much, yeah. you know, they're akin with, especially the wives, I believe, are very close there. And you see it kind of just sneaking in this way through the church. And it's very scary, especially when you see, as Joe has already mentioned, Benny Johnson, Benny Hinn, William Branham. These, this is lunacy. This is nowhere near Orthodox Christianity. This no. is nowhere near biblical Christianity. And if there's anyone, I would say, that is way outside of that scope as well, it's none other than Todd Bentley. And as mm. you're going to see in these clips, we're going to talk a little bit about him. You can see Todd Bentley with Bill Johnson. And specifically, this is at the anointing of C. Peter Wagner. And a lot of people point out that C. Peter Wagner is pretty much the theologian of the new mm. apostolic reformation. Yeah. And C. Peter Wagner is seen in these clips anointing and he's supposedly giving this anointing to Todd Bentley that was going to explode his ministry and he was more people were going to hear him more than ever and it was going to go like wildfire but what was going on with Todd Bentley that got caught right after that yeah well he was involved in serious sexual sin adultery I think he married the woman that uh yeah, his babysitter committed, yeah then he marries her and then he's restored to ministry without repentance you know uh Absolutely amazing. And, and by the way, there's a lot more to repent of than just that because that was horrible in itself. Adulterers will not inherit God's kingdom. Uh, but in all kinds of false teaching. And, and when you listen to his testimony, he talks about how he was demon-possessed. And praise God, I mean, a lot of us were oppressed by the devil. All of us one degree or another before we got saved. But he talks about this possession. He makes it sound as though he was still demon-possessed while he was ministering. And then it's interesting because he talks about how this spirit named Emma be, is like his spirit guide. And this spirit named Emma communicates with him and teaches him and uses him and speaks through him. And he says that it's the same spirit, Emma, that was using William Branham and gave him his power. 
Once again. So you see all these things are linked together like you're saying, Chad. It's all this diabolical, just ugliness that's going on. So uh, I just think it's uh, mind-boggling when you, I mean, you would think, I'm sorry, because you got to be really careful, but when you see him, you know, kicking people, like drop kicking them. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. Old yeah. people, and, you know, laying on it. He's, He's just claiming it. Well, it's a yeah. circus, you know. Yeah. I've seen him actually oh, wow. nail someone. And he's just, uh, he's just, I'm sorry, a clown at a circus, making a mockery of Christianity and taking people's money in the meantime and feigning piety. And it, it just blows me away. And it's almost like the weirder you can get, the more of a following you're going to get. And we need to stop following men and start following Jesus and say, what does your word say? How can I be right with you? And then praise God, God's given, it says, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to equip the saints. So God uses people, but you wanna make sure that you test everyone and test what we're saying. Yep. We always say that, I say that from the pulpit all the time. Test what I'm saying. The last thing I wanna do is lead anybody in any way astray. I'm very, I step into the pulpit with a fear and trembling and being prayed up before God that I don't, that I have precise theology and that I glorify the Lord. So when I see these things go on in the name of Jesus and people don't have their spiritual antennae up and they're just, they just flock to it. It just rips your heart, it just breaks your heart. It's like, Lord, this is in the name of Christ. And it gives Jesus a bad name because non-Christians oftentimes have more discernment than many these professing Christians because they could spot a charlatan a mile away and they look at somebody like Bentley and they're like it's a joke to them yeah it's it's really sad and one of the reasons we played that clip is because when he's getting that anointing right next to him is Bill Johnson yeah right next to him a bunch of bunch of other false prophets and he's sitting there getting this anointing by C Peter Wagner and then guess what oh well that maybe that was just one clip maybe they weren't together too much well who did an endorsement of Bill Johnson's book, When Heaven Invades Earth. Yeah. None other than Todd Bentley gave an endorsement for that book because they are bedfellows. Because let's be honest, maybe yeah. Bill Johnson hasn't fallen in the way he has. And by the way, some of the things that even the charismatic movement, some of the leaders in the charismatic movement actually came together and put out a list after this recent falling that, that Todd Bentley had. And I just want to point this out. When people fall publicly like that, first of all, he was never a proper teacher of biblical Christianity and kicking cancer out of old ladies yeah. and the nonsense and also the cheating on his wife. He was never a biblical pastor in terms of how the Bible describes it. But the fact is, when they have a public demonstration of wickedness and using that position to further their sexual exploits a lot of times yeah. and then have people build them up, what do you expect to happen? Yeah, you don't have a good standing with the outside community. You have no it's reason to be, to be a pastor. Reproach, to be a leader, you know. And and that's not what he was. He was not above reproach, and therefore that's what took place. And yet you have these endorsements. You have these people as strange bedfellows that aren't so strange. And the fact is, they're one with another because they're of the same spirit. Is is ultimately what what takes place. And when you when you start, we were talking a little bit before this. When you start to really put together the puzzle pieces, and you see the Benny Hins and the global influence that a guy like Benny Hins or the Kenneth Copelands, or by the way, guys, who was C. Peter? Who who did C. Peter Wagner advise on his doctrinal dissertation at Fuller Seminary? None other than Rick Warren. Yeah. When you add this together with a lot of their eschatology, their end times teaching about end times. About and this dominionism. Dominionism, seven mountain mandate, yep, you know, seven mountain mandate, the peace plans. Taking over the world for Christ and Rick Warren's peace plan, three different, you know, stole with three, uh, religion, you know, commerce and government. And that's the antichrist system at the end. So it's getting really crazy because the whole new apostolic reformation is about power. So if it's about power, wait a minute, we don't have to suffer as a church. We don't have to be the tail, we're gonna be the head. We're gonna dominate and we're gonna have dominion over the earth. And it depends on which flavor, there's different flavors within the, the NAR movement, but a lot of these guys, they talk about, you know, uh, transforming government. Right? Read the book of Revelation, that's not what happens. Nope. And guess what? If you're leading the government in the end times, you're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong side. You're on the antichrist <laughs> yeah, good side. Point. Amen. And, and so that's why I wanted to make, make this, and in this specific section, we, we delved in uh, on, onto a lot of different guys that are involved with Bethel because, as we said, it is far more than just the 11,000, which is not a small amount, by the way, the 11,000 that meet up in Reading. It's far more than the hundreds of thousands that watch every single live stream waiting at beck and call for what they're yeah. teaching. But the fact is, is that these guys actually are continuing through other people such as none other than 
Todd White. And plenty of you know exactly who Todd White is. He is the big guy with dreadlocks walking around the streets. And one of the interesting things with Todd White, as we've talked about, and he was exposed, I think, pretty clearly, not only by Chris Roseboro, but by the American Gospel uh, video. And I know that Costi Hinn, Benny Hinn's nephew, who has deflected from that movement and, and come against it, wrote a letter exposed to... Exposed his own uncle, yeah. Yeah, exposed him, and then wrote a letter to Todd White, begging him to, to, to watch American Gospel. And Todd White said, get that out of me, that's satanic, I'll never watch it. Ripped up the letter, threw away the CD with the, with the DVD on it. But what it did was expose him for the charlatan yeah. he is, because he was going around all over the streets saying, all of a sudden, I guess there's this epidemic where everyone has one leg shorter than the other. Yeah. And he's claiming to be healing people. And he's claiming, he calls it lifestyle Christianity, that he's just the gospel. And you can see him teaching at Bethel and this is the kind of stuff he's doing. Hey, he supposedly has the leg stretching anointing, you know, special anointing to stretch legs. Uh, it's the easiest miracle, by the way, to fake, you know. Uh, it's interesting too, because he's a liar and the truth is in him. You know, I can say that. He says he's without sin. I've more than once he's claimed to be sinless and the scripture is very clear first John 1 8 and 1 10 he that says he's without sin is a liar and the truth is not in him and there's a lot of you know the prosperity stuff uh, the fact that he basically gives a rubber stamp of approval to all these heretics uh, you know birds of feather flock together and it's true with the heretics so it's really crazy how the false teachers love the other false teachers it's just, when you see it, it's like, it's interesting. These yeah, he calls, are. he actually calls Kenneth Copeland one of his mentors. He did yeah. a video series together. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and as you read from Kenneth Copeland earlier, that's the heresy of heresies, the, some of the stuff that he's teaching witchcraft yeah. and, and equating that, interesting With, enough, to the Holy Spirit. I know. I mean, this Scary is, stuff. This is radically satanic. And one of the interesting things was, when I was putting together some of the clips with Joe and when I was putting together some of the information, I was trying to get secular sites to say, hey, how many people are actually attending Bethel? Because there are quite a few churches that inflate those numbers, all right? People like big numbers, and so they inflate their numbers. So I was looking at calmatters.org, and I was like, okay, how many people actually attend Bethel on a regular service? Now, we can see the YouTube numbers, but those can be bought. Views can be bought on YouTube. Twitter likes can be bought. Those things can be bought. But I want to see how many people, according to secular websites, actually go to Bethel. And while I was there, I started reading about treasure hunting. Mm. And they actually put a link in the article about Bethel and this treasure hunting sort of movement that they have. Yeah. And in the link, I found it very interesting that I've seen clips all over the internet like that. Not only have you already, if you're watching this, seen multiple clips of Todd White preaching at Bethel. Not only, if you're watching this, have you seen clips of Todd White praying next to Bill Johnson, but you've seen over and over again, these guys are buddies. And when it comes to, quote, lifestyle Christianity, which is what he calls like that ministry that he has. There's videos online with millions of views. Guys, this is not something that's not a big impact. This is not something that's not affecting the body of Christ and people's impact on the world. We need to pay attention and we need to mark them and point out their false teaching because yeah. that's exactly what this is. And so while I looked that up, I said, hey, what on earth is treasure hunting? Because at the time I had never heard of treasure hunting. I'd watch these videos, but what is treasure hunting? And according to Bethel's own website on their testimonial, this is from 2005. So this is an older article. And this is what it says. Towards the end of, of January 2005, a group of second year Firestorm students led by Kevin and Teresa Dedman drove down to Southern California to minister. Typically, this, team of, uh, this type of team travels to churches that desire more fire or to be nitro or to be glycerin. Following the Holy Spirit, they began a treasure hunt to find people needing a touch from God, prayer, or even a simple kind word. They spent a few minutes receiving a download from the Holy Spirit, asking for words of knowledge, visions, people's name, or a place they should go. Word by word, they received revelatory clues from the Holy Spirit and ended up at a local home center, list in hand. Immediately, they spotted a man with a black beanie and a gray sweatshirt with black writing, and they were, right, they were on the right track. 
without knowing how to make the first move in order to pray for him, they simply stared and nonchalantly circled around him, finally, and took someone took the plunge. And then, of course, the faux miraculous takes place during this whole scenario. But then when we look at it, doesn't this seem very similar to what we see on YouTube from a Todd White? Absolutely. Doesn't that yeah. seem like they're... He's been part of the movement for some time, actually. And so when we are putting the puzzle pieces together, and guys, this is only the second segment concerning a four-part segment on Bethel. And we, what we want you guys to do is to pay attention because this is not on accident. Satan doesn't bring a false gospel, or how about this? No one brings a false gospel, affects this many millions, by the way, of people, when you count all the people we're talking about, affects this amount of millions of people, looks back and go, and Satan goes, I really wish I would have thought about that. Yeah. That's such a He's great idea. Head, like, wow, what happened there? Yeah, that's such a great idea to, to say the Holy Spirit's like the genie from Aladdin. That's, you know, that's no big deal to say that you're little gods and you have power, life and death and the power of your tongue and you can create. You can command God. And that you're what? You little gods? You command angels. And so guys, what we're saying is open your eyes. Take a look. If this is only the, the second video you've seen, I can't wait for you to see the next two. Because the fact is, is that we're going to go deeper. And we're going to continue to go until we know without a doubt that you have no doubts Amen. in your mind that Bethel is not a movement of God. There is no house of God up there in Reading, outside, the inside of Bethel. What we want you to do is take a look at this and honestly, in your heart of hearts, recognize what the true gospel is from what the false gospel is. Amen. As you've just seen, the teachings of Bill Johnson are far more reaching than simply Redding, California. And these groups are going out sharing this false gospel. And we hope over the next two segments, you'll see truly what spirit is behind this movement.